but it's a fact. Um, and then I started to, because of living in Europe, people always come to you and say, if you speak Arabic, then can you be a consultant on typography, which is, of course, a, a challenge, because, yeah, I can read it, but I cannot be a consultant, and I don't know the history. So that, that got me actually to make this research and to make this book. And the book was surprisingly the first uh, written so comprehensively. It was, it was really a collection of somebody who was curious to find out a little bit about you know, what is the script about, why is there a problem, how did it develop in terms of typography, what were the problematics with that. And then, of course, I made the book for myself, really. And then everybody thought it was so good to me. <laughs> so there were more people that wanted to use it. Um, so it was, it was the beginning of, of, of my career, actually. It was just my own curiosity and frustration. It's a very good lesson for any student. If you can't find something, make it. So it's a film great. <laughs> um, so the second 20 years, I think it was maybe 15 years later, we made a variation on that book because, of course, the technology changes over time. So the second thicker book, which is the, the, the big bad book, this, this one is, the first one is this one, humble academic book, and the other one is big and thicker book. Um, and what, what the second book did is actually continue on um, more the recent uh, uh, technological developments of home design, but also we collected all the existing Arabic thoughts. When I first started my book, there was very few, first it was really difficult to find anything. Um, I, I didn't know any design designers, but 15 years later there were far more people and there was far more possibilities and then people were interested in sending their stuff. So we ended up with a book that was a thousand pages. The first one was a hundred. So that's interesting. Um, so this is some images from the inside. So this is the first book with all the academic information that was kind of collected from all sorts of sources and probably you know, maybe I also missed some things. Um, and this was what it was looking like uh, in terms of presenting the different designers. So there were five digital designers and three font foundries in my book. The second one was, of course, far more developed. So we also had uh, the opportunity, because you make a book, you meet people, so to invite different people to write specific texts. And then the examples grew. So then it became, you know, this is one page, an example of uh, different foundries and then their collections. And what was really interesting about the book, which the, um, kind of upset some designers, was there were work that was with a lot of free fonts. And there were lots of fonts that looked the same, not as well you know, drawn. So all of a sudden you could see who was stealing from We never said anything about it, showed everything. But some people were very upset because it was kind of like showing piracy um, in, 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 in working. So it was good. Um, then I wanted, so this is a very short introduction about um, why I was involved in the, in the Hutt Foundation. The second reason is after, in, in 2000, um, I'm not going to tell you the days, but <laughs> I went back to teach in Beirut and then I started the first book. Then I went after that and I was teaching in Dubai and I started in 2000. And, I was, um, and there I had, I had a very nice experience because all of a sudden I was in, in an Arab world that was really the Arab world because Dubai is very multicultural. Um, also in terms of the geography of the different Arab countries, different Arab people coming from different origins. Beirut is very Lebanese with a few, maybe some Jordanians and Syrians that come and study. But in, in, in Dubai I had people from Russia, from India, from Pakistan, from different countries in the Arab world, also from the Gulf, which was a really culture I didn't know. So then you come across really the multicultural mix, um, even as an Arab multicultural. Um, this is some of the trends after 2.11, a lot of things like in front of us, an awakening, you know, all, all the Arabs, and I think it's only grown since, have become very aware of their own um, reasserting their own cultural identity and also presenting a face that is not what we, what we associate with the Arab world, which is fanatics, which is uh, uh, religious fanaticism, uh, backwardness, uh, terrorism, you know, all the negative things. So they wanted to really actually look at the culture and say, no, we're going to start to do new things. We're really going to show that this is a living culture. 
that it belongs in the 20th century, 21st century, and that, of course, we are proud of where we come from, but we're going to be interpreted. We're not going to be put in a museum that looks, you know, it's all nice and graphic stuff. That is nice, but it's, it's history. We want, we're not dead, you know, we're not in a... So this is a bit the visual mix, and then, of course, then you start to say, okay, techno music in Arabic, what does it look like? Or um, fashion that is using Coca-Cola as, as, as as a base to, to make uh, chairs, to create an environment, to play with you know things that you put on your head and turn them into a mini skirt. You know, what how can we play with this? Um, in terms of typography um, and visual communication, of course the possibilities are even bigger. And then here you see a collection from different poster designers from Persia and also on this side uh, uh, um, a Jordanian calligrapher who actually made these paints for the clock crops shoes. So again, we were playing with the alphabet, looking at new products, looking at people how they live, looking at the traditional elements, and then we, you know, mixing them with other forms. Starting comic strips, which is one of the this is the first uh, really 20th century comic strip magazine called Samanda that started in the youth where they actually it's, 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 you can make, you can contribute to it, so you can write an Arabic, but you can also write in French, because some Arabs don't write very good Arabic. You can even you know, propose things in English. And, and they played with all these different stories mixed in this magazine. And then they set the trend, because now all of a sudden the comics strips and comics uh, books and uh, visual novels have become really popular since. Um, again, another uh, direction which is really important for designers but also for, for typographers is children's books in Arabic. For the longest time, children's books in Arabic were either really terrible or uh, just translations of French or English books, so they just put new Arabic text. But actually, the illustration, the whole story is not Arabic, it's not related to this child's environment. So there's a whole new movement of saying, no, we're going to write in Arabic really nice stories that are relevant to different to these different countries, but also play with the letters, play with the language, make it accessible, not you know, this language of, again, going back to um, the, the classical Arabic, this language that you read only when you're 20-something. You know, Before that, it doesn't relate to your life because it takes too much to learn. Yet, people speak Arabic. It's not that they don't. So the, the disconnection is you have to do that for children. You have to make them proud of their language through making it also visually attractive because that's what they first see is the image, not the text. So this is again the shoes. Then of course, you know, slowly another trend is graffiti. And um, this book is very interesting because they made a trying to make a collection of different um, graffiti artists from different parts of the Arab world. And then when they launched it, then they started all the real revolutions. So all the good graffiti started after the book. So I think they're probably going to do another edition. But what is interesting is also in this book, and you see it on the cover, is there's also this new movement of um, making calligraphy as graffiti. So playing with things like this. So it's anywhere between, you know, the words are, the, the form is very flexible, so you can do whatever you want. So playing with the formal aspect, uh, but also saying text that is contemporary, maybe political, and then still it's calligraphy. So it's a kind of play between, um, you know, graffiti and calligraphy. Um, this is, an, of course, Arabic, again, can be written on anything. It's uh, historically, we've always used it as a sort of visual element, so you have it in architecture, in clothing, in textile, and so on. So it's really nice to see this example of jewelry, which was made of leather, again, die cut out of calligraphy. And it says something about uh, life, celebration, and um, love. <laughs> Like love and like passion and love, not just love and peace. Um, this is another example from uh, a calligrapher who actually started working on design elements. So, with the competition that we started, that she developed um, this image on the left, which is a kind of sticker, so decoration inside the home. So, she did this tree of life, or tree of letters, and then eventually she made an actual three dimensional uh, installation of that. So again, taking you know, the text out of the page and out of printing into the third dimension. Um, another trend is, of course, looking at 
how do you cross over? So using again the, the, the decorative arabesque um, motif, if you want, and then using it as a pixel font, like creating a Latin font that looks like it's Arabic, but it's actually a Latin font. So this idea of working between the two, the two scripts, as I said in the beginning, is important. It's, it's all over the Arab world, and it's also uh, becomes so much so important for branding that a lot of companies decide when they want to make a typeface they can't find an Arabic that matches what they want they just actually commission it so that's kind of a trend that is a positive thing because at least it allows new production because as designers we always need somebody to come and say I need you to design this for me so we can start working we can't really most of the time we want to invent things by ourselves some do but in general Okay, um, what we do in Khat is actually organize conferences and, um, among other things, workshops. Um, and so when we, when we did the first typographic matchmaking, at the same time we launched the website of the, of the foundation, which is a kind of online network. It's like Facebook for Arab designers. So you can sign up for it and then you meet other designers and maybe you get information about the latest books. You um, hear about different projects, you can tell other people that in that community about projects you're doing. So it, it became, um, so we launched it thinking, okay, we'll see what happens. And then you know, within a very short period of time, it became a very well populated, and now it's about 3,500 members. And the members are, of course, what is good about it is that the members will never probably meet in reality because there's a lot of people from Iran that never travel to the Arab world, and people from Morocco that will never go to Iran. And so, this is a very nice meeting place without really, um, it's, it's more professional meeting, it's not really like a dating site, but it could be the, uh, maybe more in a professional way of dating. So this is some of the people on the side. Okay, and then I have a spelling mistake, I'm sorry, I apologize, please get that off your camera. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I'm just going to show you the first typographic matchmaking, which is a pre-sequel to the project that I will discuss more extensively. Um, the first typographic matchmaking came from this idea that we don't have enough Arabic fonts that actually uh, are well designed. That was the premise of it. Um, and the second thing was to create typefaces specifically made for contemporary book design and contemporary reading which means that they have to break a little bit away from the traditional, very classical nask, which is what is often used in, uh, it's a style that is often used in books and in newspapers. Um, so how can, we, how can we play with that? And um, so the idea was I invited five um, Dutch designers, non-Dutch designers, and I asked them to pick a typeface from their collection that they think is really good to use as a starting point. And then what we did is then invite five other um, Arab designers and make them into teams of one Arab, one Dutch. And then they would, together, of course, the Arabic touches will be designed by the designer or the Arab designer, but with the guidance of the Dutch, because it will have some kind of connection to the Latin. So an interesting premise, because of negotiating what things can actually go from the Latin to the Arabic. Um, the experience was good. Um, because at the end, what we, the first thing we discovered, which was really what I say about Arabic again as a very flexible writing system, is that all faces were different, but not dramatically different. You know, they were different in detail, but they had more or less the same proportions, more or less the same shape letters. So what was different is the minor details. When it came to the Arabic, this is the, this is the list of variation. It's, it was really incredible that you put the, the Latin, and then you can say, okay, some of the Latin typefaces were serif and some were sans serif. That was a major difference. But the Arabic were completely different. And still, we work together as companions. Um, this is some of the results. These are three of the typefaces. So you can see here the connection between the fresco Latin and the, and the fresco Arabic. And then you can see the connection, for example. What was interesting is that they had to decide how to work with it. So in this case, for example, they started with this idea that the two typefaces, that, that they would use the same writing tools. So they used for, um, for fresco, it was written with, with what they call a blunt uh, a pen. So it's kind of rounded. 
tip. Um, and then they, they did a research to find an equivalent in the, in the Arabic version, and the only written script that was written that way was um, the Maldives script, which is based in North Africa. So they started from the Maldives script. So their starting point was actually the writing tool. Um, another group cited with this idea that you know the font was designed to be really widely used in newspapers and for for small text for uh, let's say dictionaries and so they looked for an example of that convention in Arabic and worked on it. So this was for the for the Fedra. and then for um, and then the third example that I'm going to give because there's five fonts actually. Um, is also for Fedra, they decided that the Arabic would be sort of the sunset version. Um, for, for the Serbia font, they decided that the Arabic, because Arabic has more of a calligraphic feel, that it would actually be a companion for the, for the italic of the, of the font. So the way they worked with it was not just to, um, and of course, we made this, this typeface, and a lot of people criticize it, yeah, but you are forcing Arabic to become like Latin, which is not at all the case. But it was very interesting to, to look at the study and say, well, where can they meet? Because it's all about meeting. Um, so this is some of the examples of these typefaces. Sorry, I have to go fast. <laughs> so this is some of their studies and how they could be used. This one, for example, was, uh, was the Vesta, which was made for Rome for the signage. And so the Arabic had to take a sort of monumental um, script and work with it, which is a very simplified monumental script called Kufi, and then modify it so that it, it, this comes very close. What we also discovered is actually that this style of writing works best with Latin because it is much more upright, it's a simplified version, and it has something to do more with the rhythm of Latin script. It's much simpler. But it doesn't mean that that's the only way to work. Um, then what, uh, what happened with this project is then we wanted to exhibit it or actually launch it in Amsterdam. And so we had to think of, of a way to do that, uh, to make the topic more for everybody to react to it. So we, we, made the, we, brought, we also invited more designers, Dutch and Arab, to come up with a new um, concept for, for an exhibition. And that what we came up with is to actually take a department store that is quite Dutch department store known for its Dutchness and actually turn it into completely in Arabic. Um, and then, um, but it was an exhibition, it was not a real store. The only thing is that the exhibition, you could actually buy pieces from it, which was the whole point, is to bring the exhibition to the people, to take typography from being something very technical and make it available to other people. Um, and it got a lot of attention, so we actually made products and um, fashion products, chocolates. We tried to think of things where you know, Arabic and Latin could, could work, but also products that people can actually take away. Anyway, um, then at the end of that project, after the exhibition, we also had a book, and the book had a CD with it, and people could buy it and have a sort of the better version of the fonts. And what happened with that was that uh, the book sold out very quickly, and um, people actually used these typefaces very widely. So I'm just going to show you examples. I found some, some on the internet. Sometimes people send me stuff of a protest using, <laughs> using one of our typefaces, a graffiti in Beirut using one of our typefaces, an exhibition in a, in a cultural, uh, exhibit, in an art fair in Dubai using the typeface for the library, somebody making stamps. Um, we used it for, I've used it for books that we have designed. Uh, somebody used it, for example, this uh, Fedra was used as an art piece in New York on walls, which, which was kind of putting Arabic text on walls was the project of this artist, and then he put some nonsense story or a joke. It was just a kind of uh, public art. I mean. um, some things, you know, and it's very interesting to see how these typefaces are often used, how people select to say, well, we want to use this typeface when it's about text and when it's literary or when it's when it has to give this kind of graphic feeling, or we use this typeface, which is more um, Roman, uh, more, more Latin-like, if you want, more simplified, goofy. Then we use it for headlines, we use it for things that have to look contemporary. Um, I've myself designed a whole book with it because I thought it was really interesting to break from 
the traditional way of making text for reading. Of course, this is not a literary book, this is a catalog for art, which means it gives you a lot of freedom to do what you like. And so I played with that idea of how do you use this text, how do you create you know, bilingual things, so you have two texts and they have to look good on the page together, and we're talking about very small text, so why not? Um, I think you can set, set a whole book with it, but it's more like you have to get people used to reading differently. And that's a very, reading culture is very conservative in general. So it's very interesting to, you know, you can do this on a website, you can do that for branding, but if you start to make a book, then you, you get a lot of resistance. But you still have to do it, I think it's good. So this is some example of, you know, how these fonts are used from very high-end projects or to very you know, popular things as a protest on the street. And that to me was the whole point of the project, actually. Um, you make something because you want to, you think it's important, and it's very gratifying to see that other people also think it's useful. And then it changes the way that people think. Then all of a sudden, you know, people wanted, to, uh, companies wanted to have their own typeface. They wanted to have more typefaces. They wanted to have more selections. So that's like the most successful part of it. Um, then in the meantime, you know, I'm just going to show you one other project we did. So talking about you know, what can you do with, um, with typography, um, I was invited as a foundation to do an exhibition on, on typography. But then it was in the context of this big um, commemoration of Islamic art uh, exhibition that took place in New York 100 years ago. And it was the first, and it was the first one to set this field in motion, actually. And it was apparently very big, successful, and quite impressive. Um, and what they did is to commemorate that, that the House of Kunst in Munich decided to do a second, well, a commemoration exhibition where they used some pieces from that old uh, exhibition. They used, uh, they wanted to show the work of contemporary artists or modernist artists from the Arab world, and then they wanted to do something with the contemporary art that is happening, which has nothing to do with Islamic art, it's just artists from the Middle East doing art. Um, so we were invited to be part of that, which was kind of a very strange context because you're in a fine art context, so how do you work with typography? Um, so this is an example of you know, the material that was there. So you have contemporary artist's work, you have the work that is from that old collection, really hundred years old pieces that are beautiful, and then you have our work. And so, um, so the decision was to actually make typography that is not about printing again, but it is about um, using this space for letters. So some of the projects, so what we did is commission a few designers, we were about five designers, a fashion designer, a graphic designer, a product designer, actually um, two product designers and three graphic designers that worked on it. And each one had to interpret this idea of, of letters in their work. So there was a mural with all the fonts that we have uh, developed as a sort of introduction to this. Um, the, the fashion, uh, the, the, one of the product designers decided to make um, a concrete poetry on concrete floor, but the floor was to make a carpet actually. So every block, so it's a modular carpet made of different blocks, and every block is dedicated to one letter, and that's a text poetry. And, they, and then she developed a typeface specifically for that, and got it engraved, and then used it um, in this huge space. Um, another person worked on other research on this one, um, one, time, one ligature, the Lam Alif, and uh, she, she made the research and collected all the existing Lam Alifs as, as very as possible, and then reworked them into plexiglass and made a, a curtain that is about 40 meters high, about three meters wide with a thousand letters, a thousand lam alifs, and the lam alif uh, is, is pronounced la, and la means no in Arabic, so it's a thousand times no, so it was kind of a, you know, again, a sort of political protest before the revolution, so it's nice that it happened afterwards. And then she documented that into a thousand something page book. So it's like a dictionary. This is an example of you know how one letter form in this case it's it's a ligature but it's a, it's a very it's an um, it's an actual glyph so um, it's an obligatory ligature it's not optional so you have so many variations of that from you know, very ornamental to 
so if you'd like to do anything. Okay, I'm going to take that. Now I'm going to talk about the project, uh, the last project, um, which is also pretty long. So based on the successes of the, of the typographic matchmaking, the first one, and working also, being encouraged to work uh, and experiment with working with letters outside of the printed world and more into material and into a physical space, um, we came up with this idea that maybe it's time to work on a on a project that deals with lettering, public space, and architecture. So the teams were bigger, so they were three-person three teams. We had, again, five teams, and the, the three-person teams were Dutch-Arab, uh, two designers, graphic uh, type, and uh, architect, or product designer. And the idea was to look at um, <coughs> to actually be inspired from public space to look at what, what happens with text in, 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 in our living environment. It's, we use text everywhere around us, so it's, it's uh, in the products we buy, it's in the clothes we wear, it's on the streets. It's, but what is interesting is that when it's on the streets, it's, always, it's often an indication. Like, this is where I exist, this is my shop, right? go left. You know, it's always instructional, it's never really um, it never really engages the space. Most of the time, it's just a skin over a building. You know, it's it's almost um, like a, a sticker. You know? it's, it's not really part of it. So we looked at a lot of things like um, uh, the way, for example, text was used in Arabic or old Islamic architecture. It was an element of ornament. It was really poetry. Sometimes it was. Uh, Sometimes it, it also said, you know, this is the mosque was built by so and so, so it had information. But sometimes it was also just beautiful poetry or just nonsense. It's just visuals. It has no meaning. And then we looked also at things like um, in the turn of the century when architects were actually doing the lettering for the buildings, and this belief that the building and whoever lived in it was, you know, whoever inhabited this building, whether it was a company or something, was kind of eternal. So the, the architecture. And the writing were just part of the stone. They were part of the building. It's almost you have to cut them out. So that was very nice to, to look at that and say, well, maybe we need to think about that. You know, we do things always as designers in a very ephemeral way. We think we're going to be you know, put aside the next day. So what if we look at the poetry of typography in space? What does that mean? So it's a very open-ended question. So we did a few trips in Holland, in uh, Dubai. Um, at some point we had in Dubai, we could uh, use, um, we had a, a building, an old, an old architecture, um, as old as, as, as possible in Dubai, one of the older parts that was in the port, and they used it as cultural spaces, so we could have one space, we could use it to, to meet people, to have discussions about our project as it was going on, and to actually be in an architecture that's not made with this idea, it's going to be, you know, change tomorrow. So this is a bit of fun. Um, looking around at being kind of uh, tourists. Looking at how signages, so this was our workspace, our house. We could do an exhibition, we could open it up, people could come in and talk to us about what we were doing. It was really good to have a sort of you know, feedback as you're doing the research. <laughs> Look at the examples of, you know, lettering from the 1970s, um, these light boxes that were kind of bilingual and how, how people were trying to kind of make them look the same, and things that are very calligraphic that are done in the old-fashioned way, really engraving into the metal and then painting it by hand, and then things like contemporary, which were stickers, basically, stuck on the wall. So it's really good. Um, example of things. Then what happened is then each designer or each design group, each team um, decided to take a direction. So the first team, um, their font was called Kufan because they worked on this Kufi and Amsterdam lettering, so it's a combination of two groups. But they wanted to explore this idea of typography that is made for signage, but a signage that is not about directions, but a signage that is kind of mapping uh, the life of the city. So they, they wanted to work on this idea of emotions. 
um, the emotional aspects of, of text. I should have showed you more slides. This is, um, this is what they end up with in terms of the Arabic. Um, they, they use the, the old um, Kufi sign, which is one of the earliest writing, and of course they modified it. And they looked at the same time at what could be possibly a good match for it in Latin, and then they worked from the Amsterdam style of Art Deco. And somehow the connection between those two things is plain. It actually comes from this idea of, of, of constructing your letters for heavy material. So they cannot be, you know, they cannot be light, they cannot be, they cannot have fussy details. They should have a monumental, very impressive presence. Of course, it's a, it's a typeface that should, should work in different ways. So of course, they made the light version of it, which is alien to both original things. I mean, you don't make light version of, of Kufi. But they did, and it's kind of interesting to see, you know, the skeletal shape and this kind of relationship between these two scripts. So when you see them on the page, of course, they they work together, but they're very different <coughs> at the same time. And that is the beauty of, of this project. So they tried to imagine, okay, now the next step was, and the project was to imagine how they could possibly be used, and they came up with this idea that. <coughs> They should be able to be read, to be read on a very small scale because that's how we read signage. Really, we read it on our iPhones, but we also read it in public space on the three-dimensional thing. And then to look at how we can interact with the physical environment, and if it was to be engraved. So, if we're going to use it for traditional things, what does it look like? <coughs> The second project was um, called Hamsa, which is really, um, it means whisper in Arabic, and it was very interesting. It was, I think the name of all these projects came in the very end, obviously. In this one, it was interesting because the whole process was about editing and editing and editing until almost nothing is left. <laughs> That's why they called it the whisper. Their starting point was actually starting with this um, with physical building material. So they looked at, uh, because we, we did our research trips between Dubai and Amsterdam, they were looking at how people actually did the uh, city planning and how there was a lot of um, sort of graving, engraving, no, what is the word in English? Um, when, when, you, when you take the sand out and you let water in, and vice versa. So this playing with water and sand, of bringing the sea into the land, bringing the, you know, covering up part of the sea. And, um, and these are two techniques that are used in both cities, so they thought, okay, maybe this is, could be an interesting starting point. So we start with the actual physical aspect of, of, of building. So the whole project started with sand, and what they did is actually they started playing on, on the beach in sand, trying to make letters in the sand, um, carving them, pouring wax, trying to see how to make them stand up so they put them on sticks, they're still two-dimensional. Um, then they tried some experiments you know, using that form so they came up with die cut them, what does it look like, how do you put it in space, how, you know, you can just have two letters on sticks. Um, then while they were doing that, of course, the negative thing became interesting, so they were thinking, ah, oh, maybe we could use the negative space to make graffiti or to make stencils or... But they still wanted to do three-dimensional thing, so then they extruded what they were playing with. So slowly, slowly, this project kept developing in all sorts of directions. So it became about, you know, using the same strip to create different parts of a letter, like strokes of a letter. But they became forms, so they could be completely sculptural. But their surface can be again something you can write on. Um, so they made experiments for real to see whether it actually works. So finally, they came up with this a form. The form is not so. Um, the form or the structure of the writing is not so unusual, but the way it developed was a very nice process. And also, they became it became about stencil fonts that are not uh, what we assume stencil fonts often are, these very kind of rigid, uh, cut-up pieces. It was really writing, and then cut up in, the, in a way that makes sense as, as the way you write, in the different strokes, rather than in a very rigid, um, straightforward way. So they played with that idea. Um, then they developed 
based on that. So they make variations of their typeface as letters that are um, like the drawing of the letters or the negative thing, which could be the, the stencil form. And they even made one version, which is the dance steps version. And then some of the applications for that, of course, was, was uh, is endless, of course. So some of the ideas of, of that was to look at how you can actually engrave it in stone, or in this case, pour it or carve it out of concrete, or use it to make die cuts. So for example, if you were to, to have a covered souk, um, which is very common in the Arab world, what if the the, the letters were what you cut out rather than, so what if you have shiny letters coming down from the sky and you can still walk on them but they're, you know. So they played with some of the experiments for that. The idea was again to, to, to make a, a system, what was very important about the project is to create ideas and systems that people can take and kind of rework in their own way. So we propose these ideas, but then somebody can take these drawings and these typefaces and actually develop something new from them. And this was really at the base of the project I'm going to show you now. <clears throat> so this project is called Nukhat, and Nukhat means dots. And it's, um, they, they struggled with this idea of how do you make it two systems work together. And they thought, okay, we cannot make, we, we don't want to merge them, we want them to kind of work like two plant farms uh, growing around each other, like a DNA. So they work together, they complement each other, they work in different ways, but they also um, not the same thing. And they started with this uh, a specific uh, style of, of Arabic calligraphy called uh, square kufi, which is really making um, it's not only that you make square letters, but you also, when you write it, you build it as blocks like. So it's a really very decorative form. And of course, it's very suitable to work with in a, as an art piece or poetic thing. You don't want to write the whole text with that. And then they decide maybe that's too rigid. Maybe, maybe it's good to go back and look at maybe um, other possibilities, like more calligraphic possibilities. Could it be possible to use the calligraphic possibilities to still create this idea of two scripts that are continuously dancing around each other, um, that can be written in one sentence, connected all the time, so they're all connected, whether you write Latin or Arabic, or you can mix the words in between. So they were looking at things, an example like this example, which is a kind of uh, simplified tracing from um, a style of calligraphy, um, Okay, I can take it. Um, a style of calligraphy, I can't remember the name. Um, I can't remember the name of the style, but it's basically a way of writing continuously. So there's no, there's no separation between the words. And they use that as a kind of way to develop their typeface. Um, still on this idea of a grid. And with, with the reason behind the grid was that they, you could um, either work with just dots, or connect the dots, or change the shape of the dots. And every time you play with that, um, you change the form of the letter. So for example, here you have an example of how it could possibly work. So you have dots, but then if you connect them, it's a line. But then the line can have a different skin. And it can be also not that curvy in here, like the same on top, it can be more geometric. So their idea was that depending on the material you're going to use and the production techniques, you can actually play with it. So it's a, it's a grid, it's, it's like a, a, a skeleton for a potential typeface. Of course, they used mostly the dotted one. I think they liked it the most. And then they thought about this idea of you know, how, how you would be able to use it so it can be on a screen like a LCD screen, LED, sorry. Um, so it can be used in something like inside the metro to give information. And since it's a, it's a multi-language, why not also include icons in it? So the idea is that you have a connecting line and you keep adding dots and it makes shapes, drawings, text. Um, but then if you connect them and you start to make three-dimensional objects, it can be um, a physical object, like uh, something that can be in a park that 
kids can play on and it says something. And maybe they learn a few words from playing on it. It can be something for signage, so it's just, you know, lights on the wall. It can be objects in the space. So if you look from outer space, you can read it, but actually it's also public furniture. It can be really public furniture where you, in this example, they imagine that you have this bench and these, you know, this is an image, for example, from, uh, from Sharjah, where there's a lot of these empty uh, um, piazzas that are empty, completely empty, and, and it's in a sunny place, so nobody actually uses them because nobody's going to stand in the middle of a hot place and with no shading and so on. Um, so why not use something like this where you force people to actually sit and relax in a place like this? It's possible if it's shaded. And if the text then becomes poetry, then you start a conversation because it's in two languages. So this was one example. Um, or it can be on the staircase, so it becomes something that sticks out of the wall rather than being punched into. So the possibilities are actually many. And they only showed some examples. And, um, and it was interesting that at the same time that they were working on this, other people on the same group were working on something in a bit different. Another group was working on something similar but different. Um, in this group, they used um, this, the name Kashida comes from uh, a very simple um, element in Arabic calligraphy. That is, basically, it's a system of extending the letters so you can justify a text. So you can, instead of adding spaces, you add little strips of um, lines. And in metal, in metal type, they, they, were, they had a few of them, so they were really an object, I guess. Um, but in reality, um, it's just a, a, a line, the thickness of the baseline. Yeah. And so they wanted to use this idea of this strip as a connection. So what if you know a, a font is made out of just one long strip, and if you bend it in different ways, you get letters. So this was the premise of this. So they started by experimenting with physical strips. So the first thing they did was bring a bag of tagliatelle, break it on the and look at how actually material uh, falls naturally. Um, so this was a, a starting point. And then they looked into this and they sorted out and they discovered Arabic letters in there. So this was all began with the joke of you know, Arabic is just a big spaghetti. It's just like all these curves and curves and curves. So they played with that idea. And then to sketch, they actually made uh, strips of very thin aluminum and they really sat down and they started really bending them to get the form and to look at it as a sculpture because they're not making a typeface that is supposed to be printed, they're making things that are supposed to be objects. So why not sketch also as an object? Why not bend it and look at it and see where you can do it, what is the visibility, how does it stay interesting for you, matter what direction you look at it. So they work together trying to see <coughs> What are the, the gestures or the bendings that they could make that would work for Latin and for Arabic? Where are the things that are different? Of course, this is you know, at, the end, at the heart of writing, actually, because um, Latin is very, um, even the way you hold your pen, something's not correct, it gets bigger. But you, know, you write with the steady hand, and with Arabic, you actually write like you're drawing. You just do this, and there's no one way. There's not one stroke that is at the same angle as another. <coughs> so the Latin had to become crazy, basically. And what you find in this experiment is, because the Arabic is so free, the Latin was following it. But what the result was, was a crazy Latin typeface and a very perfectly normal Arabic one, which is very nice to see. And so this is the Latin. Um, and what they did in the process is actually make the sketches, scan them, make the drawing in 3D software on the computer, and then print it in uh, 3D printing. And then go back to the drawing and then change things again. <coughs> so working directly with the material is very important. So you see here this Arabic word is perfectly normal. Whereas the Latin, I, I think you can, you can have a not an easy time reading it, and it doesn't fit on any baseline, and it's completely insane. Um, whereas the Arabic was just, it's, 
normal that you have. If you go up and down this, the, the baseline that you make a letter on top, you go down, and that, this is perfectly normal, perfectly natural for, for the script. And there, nothing did not have that freedom. So it was very interesting to, in this experiment, to completely flip it. And you can say, well, it's got some charm, but you know, I don't know, maybe some people would think it's hideous. I think it's very funny. So this is the word design. You cannot sit on one line. Whereas the design in Arabic that you see here, it sits perfectly on one line. Of course, it has multiple base lines, but it's really linear. And the, 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 the English one doesn't. So this was a nice experiment. But then what you end up with in this type of case is, of course, you don't have a font in the traditional sense of software. Although it is only software, you can only have it if you produce it. You can only have it if you print it as a 3D object. And it's a little sculpture. It can be, you know, and their idea was eventually it can be. So it went away from being in the public space to something we can actually probably the best solution for it is to wear it. Because if you make a building that looks like this, or uh, I mean, a roller coaster that looks like this, it's probably like, it costs millions to produce. But conceptually, it's a very nice thing. The last project is the opposite of this. It's actually um, the one that is almost uh, perfect for making 3D things. So it's easy to produce in whatever material you want. Um, their, their premise was to look at how, um, okay, so how do you bring two cultures together? Uh, what is it like to have a conversation in a public space? And with that, they came with this um, analogy to um, a train station where people actually come from all over the world, but they all kind of meet, but they don't really meet, and like they don't actually mix, they just meet, say hello, and then they go their direction. So this this, uh, this vision of culture, of how people meet, but they don't quite become this other culture, they just kind of are aware of it, and then they go on, maybe they carry some memory from that, maybe they don't. And this ephemeral thing led them to look at um, examples of lettering from the old-fashioned uh, old uh, timetables in, in stations where the letters flip and they do things. But they're all very modular. And they thought, okay, we're going to start with a really very, very rigid modular thing. So the aim is not, is to make all the letters exactly fit in, no matter what language, no matter what letter form, to fit exactly in this, in this format. And the format is something that would be like the screen format. Uh, computer screen or the little video screens or so on. So they worked with this, um, I think it's a two by three format, and that was their limitation. And based on that, they made a lot of um, experiments. And the idea is that you read this sometimes, which was very interesting in this project. Um, let me see if I have examples here. Um, what was very interesting in this project is they made two variations that are almost not visible, the variation. Um, but there were two variations where one you can read better if it's printed, and the other one you can read better if it's animated. And the reason for that was the animated one, um, you don't read you don't read words, you actually read letter by letter. So you read A and B because it's moving, so you're actually guessing one letter at a time, so it makes it very easy to read. But the minute you take that typeface, you print it, you start to read images, you start to read the whole word, and then it didn't work anymore. So they had to make something strange, very subtle variations, which is very nice to see. So I'll show you later the, those differences. So they made experiments with that, and their idea was that with this typeface, you can cut it out to the material because it's all square edges. Um, you can make it for pixels. You can, of course, print everything. Um, this is supposed to be an animation. <laughs> Sorry, it's a big deal. Um, and, then, and, and this is the two variations. And I think it's not easy to show it here because um, one is for the screen, and one is for text. And the one that's for text has a bit more rounded dots, a little bit different spacing, a little bit different connections, and you have to see them in text to see this difference. I'm sorry, I don't have, a, I don't have an example. Um, but you see it, I go back, maybe it's possible to see it here. When you, when you see it here, for example, this text version is actually still legible. Um, but if you see the, this part, which is the screen version, it becomes more challenging because it's all 
there's no more spaces between the letters and when there's a word space it's too big and there's no way to, to separate them. So it becomes, and then what they did is actually exaggerate that effect and take away any letting between them. So they're really blocks, physical blocks. And the idea was not that the most important thing was to actually create a poetic image rather than a text to read. So if you guess the system, you can read it, but it's very, but you don't have to. You can also look at it and just be impressed and then discover a few words and actually discover what it is there. So you can always look at it later. You can see it as flat material, you can see it as animated stuff, but you can also build uh, volumes with it very easily. Um, and in this case, for example, they made an experiment where they actually wrote the text in the shade. So it's actually the negative shapes are the text, so it says here in the shade, if you can read it. And then in Arabic. But it can also be light boxes, it can be screens that are animated. So instead of having you know, always information about uh, in front of a train station, you can also just say poetry or the latest news or some jokes. You know, why not have a bit of more of a humane connection to the city rather than all the time it's you know, informative, cold, distant. So these are some of their suggestions. They even went as far as imagining that you know, instead of having a with all these glass windows, just complete glass, what if you know, the windows, when they open, they become text? So different times of the day, you read different texts. This is something that would appeal to John and Will, but probably impossible to do. And this is what you do when you build it physically. It's, it's very easy to play with. Um, at the end of the process, we did a film, a documentary of the whole process, which was a very nice luxury. But it was important to also um, have these ideas by the designers talk about their experience of how do you work outside your own culture and what, what, you, what you learn from that, why do you do it, um, how does it change the way you look at your own at yourself, because that's the most important um, thing in, in a process like this is you all, all of a sudden have to explain why you do things in a certain way and it makes you think because most of the time you don't think enough, you just do them because you're used to them. It's also um, Interesting because it makes you um, realize that it's very difficult to say which is better, what's the best way to work, what works best. Sometimes just questioning too much makes you feel very uncomfortable. And then this comfort is very interesting because it also opens new possibilities. So we made, um, after this project, and I'm just going to show you very quickly now, um, just some experiments of what if you're going to apply these things, or what have we learned from them? And the most important thing is to give this work to someone else. And in this case, it's a completely different designer who's going to, who is sitting there working on, on this idea of you know, what happens when you, you can make beautiful images on the computer, obviously, but what, what can you do with this idea of, of typography in public space or typography for product design? Um, so you see here again the storyline font becoming a sort of wall that could be a wall of separation inside or outside in, in public space or in somebody's home. We made some experiments on seeing on physical material how it would work on, on, in die cuts, for example. And these are machine die cut letters. Um, and then you have to make some time modifications to the letter forms because the computer cannot the router cannot cut everything actually. And then you discover that some things take forever to produce and other things are really fast and easy. Um, you also discover, and this is, a, a, we made a real prototype of this is a drawing of it, of, you know, if you're going to do the nice techniques of beveled lettering, which is that you have a little bit a different um, angle that's not cut like this, the letters, but they go inside. So you have a different router machine. Some letter forms don't work at all. I mean, some typefaces, this typeface was excellent for that. It created really beautiful depth and really different um, way, even though it was had complicated curves. But it wasn't too complicated. This typeface was very easy to do anything you want to it, but, um, but then you can add the complexity of working on different layers. So some things are engraved, some things come out, some things are like an two and a half inch. This one was a nightmare because computer to get every single dot. So in a way, it's something that you probably would discover then later that maybe it's easier to work on that with metal because then you can do laser printing when it's no problem. So it's all these nice experiments that we 
playing with. And then we thought, yeah, let's make a new typeface, which is something to do with this project that's inspired by it, of making something that is, again, really stencil with much, you know, just really simple strokes. And then seeing if, is it possible to do it so that the lettering are not engraved, but they look like their shadows. They're actually cut into the material, but they look like, you know, like they went through sunlight or something, so they're not cut on a straight angle. We have to test whether that is possible. This is for and this is some examples of you know what you can do in public space with text. Can you sit on it? Can you read it? Can it be a shadow that leaves something on the floor? How do you react to that? How do you start up? It's a nice way to start conversations from my experience. So if you wear a t-shirt and people come to you and they always ask you what does it say and then you start a conversation. So even simple things like that are important, I think, especially in this time and age, to have this feeling that you know we don't live in places that are soulless. There's lots of text, but it doesn't say anything. That's it. Thank you. French um, engraver of types 
one of the greatest engravers of types in the history of typography, Robert Grandjean, made beautiful uh, Arabic typefaces for the uh, for the um, Typographia Medici Orientale in Rome in the 1580s. Now the no longer, we no longer see Italians, English, Americans, French designers designing Arabic uh, typefaces, but the Arabic peoples are doing it themselves, and I think they are going to be starting to inspire us who are familiar with Latin, uh, Latin script because their designs and their ideas and their creativity is absolutely boundless, uh, and I think this, is, this evening really has been an inspiration for us. Of, 
you're watching. You can't read it anymore. Ah, okay, you can't read it anymore. No. Okay. So this, this no, it was really about creating form. It was really about thinking of it as a sculpture. You can only read it from one direction, from looking at one direction, because from the other side you couldn't. That doesn't mean that you can't do that. I, I have an example of somebody who's uh, actually built a whole bench made of, 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 uh, of one word, of uh, two words. From one side it's one word, from the other side it's another word, and they morph them. So basically the shape changes in the middle, and then that is a bench so that you can sit on it. So it's nice to film it. But yeah, these are, you can't make a whole typeface like that. That's impossible. That's, uh, that would be very challenging. Because I, you mentioned that the first project was criticized for bringing uh, uh, latent structures into Arabic typography. Yeah. Uh, but while I was looking at the second part of the, the, the more recent project, I, I had the impression that uh, the opposite happened, but in a very good way. So yeah. designers that were uh, just able to work with latent pattern fonts start, started something different. <coughs> points of view and managed to have something which was completely new yeah. to the uh, Latin type design. So uh, did you uh, discuss this with the designer that you invited to the project to, to see if this had any influence in the work as type designers in general? Um, in this project I have to be, um, I have to say that there were also people that were not type designers per se, they were graphic designers and they could do Latin as well. Mm -hmm. So they had a bit more freedom in the sense that they're not trained with this because I think if you're trained in a good or type design, you have to, you, you have rules to learn and it's very difficult to go against that. And somehow as a graphic designer you're a bit naive outside of it, you feel like you can play with it. So that was one one thing that was a bit different. But but the only the other thing that's very different in this project also is that we did the two scripts at the same time. So there was freedom. They could go either direction. And it's up to them how they decided. What was interesting is that all the, the legends and uh, Latin designers, they were more interested in the Arabic because it was far more flexible. And because we said it's experimental and we can, legibility is not the priority, it's more the emotional effect that you can get out of the work, then there was no problem anymore. And they found it really more interesting. The designers that worked on the first project were a little bit jealous because <laughs> they didn't have as much to do in any way. But on the other hand, having said that, the first project is very widely used, so the public appreciates them and they're really well done. And they set the standards, which is not something you can, okay, they're not maybe spectacular, but they're very important and they're very well done. So it's, it's two different beasts. It's, uh, it's apples and oranges. No, because we really wanted, 
yeah, I mean, it, there's so many people working in this field, but it was really the difference is that we were not making sculpture. We were really trying to make a system which is different. When you make typography, you have to make it in such a way. One of the premises is that people, other people can use your work. So they can either use it because they have a copy of it, but they can also use it in a way that they can play with it and modify it. So it was very important that it's a system rather than a one-off thing. No, not just one word, but actually something that you can make different things with, that it's flexible enough that you can explore, that you can change scale, you can make it really small, really big, you can change material, you can, uh, you know, make any word you like with it. And, and think about letters, uh, yeah. And also, it was important that it is something that you can put in any different context. I mean, it's because you don't make a font for one one city, and you could, but that's not the project. The project should make it, and you know, you should be able to write uh, uh, any kind of words, any any language that uses this script, which could be Italian, French, Arabic, uh, Dutch, uh, German. Well, you probably would have to make some modifications and add a few characters, but in principle, it should be a flexible thing, which means that. It's also the way the letters combine cannot be, it has to be systemized. You can't be just, because then it's no longer typography. It's really yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Because there's another thing I was thinking about when you were speaking, which is. Uh, you uh, propose another side topic, which is not strictly typography, but the fact that using text, which is not information in public space, can in a way invite people to make a different use of those spaces. So I was wondering what are your views and what you, uh, before the lecture we were discussing that you, this is an open proposal for other people to use it and that you are hoping that we'll start something, yeah. some specific. So, so you, what are your opinion on, on this? How text can be an, uh, a factor that makes a public space alive and inviting for the citizen to be? Um, I mean, we, we try to test it actually. It's, actually. it's very difficult to have an, an opinion that's, I mean, it's not a scientific, um, I, I don't have a scientific proof or anything. Um, but we try, we, we we did at the end of the project. We did a workshop with uh, designers, local designers in Qatar, in Doha, and um, we said, okay, we have the freedom to use this also and as a as a as a palette, as a, as a thing you can draw. Um, so you have to come up with something that you you make people that use this space, which is a commercial space, but it's also a touristic space because it's kind of old. And, um, and it's a place where there's restaurants, it's a kind of social place. To, to tell the story of the soup through typography, and we're going to create three-dimensional typography and somehow to make people to add to it. And um, our experience was that people were very fascinated. I mean, it actually worked the way I, was, I, I would think it should work, is that you should text and people come and say, they try to read it because it's text. First, they actually go on to read it. So then you have already a meaningful communication with them. Um, we had things, discussions where can you put things in public space without permission? You know, we came about something completely different. And then, uh, do you have the permission to put it here? And then we said, yeah, we have permission, which we didn't have. And then there was a policeman that decided he likes the steps in this post, and then it became the permission, because it was an official person stepping in. So I don't know, I, I think in a way it, it does make people. Because when, when you're reading information, it, it, when you read text that is only information that's supposed to help you, which in my experience hardly ever does, actually. I, I'm always lost, so I know it doesn't work. But it, it tells you you don't need to talk to people anymore because you have all the information. And sometimes if you ask people directions and they, they say, go read the sign. You know? so, but then if it's the sign is not in, if there's signs that are more about people wondering what then you create connections with people, you bring back that you know, human factor in, in, in actually wayfinding, which is what wayfinding designers try to avoid, is to have, help you not be lost without having to depend on another person. 
But in a way, sometimes when you depend on another person, you learn information that is far more connecting to this place rather than just going from A to B. So it's good to be lost. Most of us, it's not good to be lost in the other people, I guess. But maybe there's some information designed as well. I mean, I did that also for a living for a while. <laughs> I don't know, did I answer your question? Probably not. Yeah, but I think it's 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 personal. It's this idea that you know you're always ashamed to ask questions when there are signs that are supposed to tell you. And uh, sometimes the signs tell you because you don't want to know, you want to know something different. You want to know more. If you put them all on the sign, then the city will be covered with instructions for everything. Thank you all for being such good listeners.